Okay, so today I want to begin by discussing uh, solvents and some of their properties, and subsequently we will discuss how they rea uh, affect reaction kinetics. Uh, so in the context of substitution and elimination reaction, solvents are essential to understanding rate enhancement. And solvents simply are the media in which reaction occurs. facilitates the dissociation of the bulk starting material so that the nucleophile or the base can interact with the substrate in solution. And generally speaking, uh, solvents are going to have two main characteristics that are essential. Uh, they'll have some polarity. They may be quite polar, in other cases nonpolar, but that polarity as measured by dielectric constant is going to influence reaction rate. Depending on what the reaction mechanism is, it may be ideal to have a polar solvent. It may be more ideal to have a less polar solvent. We'll examine those examples. Another characteristic that solvents generally need to have is they need to be inert, or they need to be non-reactive towards the substrate. There is one exception to this, and that is the case where you're doing a solvolysis reaction. Solvolysis is an SN1 process, or E1, where the solvent molecules are the nucleophile themselves. So when I think of solvents, I generally first categorize them into two broad groups. And you should do the same. There are those that are polar and those that are nonpolar. And these terms are relative, okay? There are scales of polarity. Um, but I'll give you some examples and we'll, and we'll talk about how we sort of have a cutoff, what we call polar versus nonpolar. Uh, but polar solvents, of course, are going to be molecules that have permanent bond dipoles. They will contain functional groups like CO bonds, CN bonds, maybe sulfur oxygen bonds, etc. And in these functional groups, there's some key bond dipole that leads to a charge separation. Where oxygen is more electronegative, of course, than sulfur, and therefore the sulfur has a positive partial charge and the oxygen has a partial negative charge. Conversely, nonpolar compounds or solvents are going to have no net dipole. Even if there are individual bond dipoles, for example, in this commonly used organic solvent tetrachloromethane, each of the carbon chlorine bonds has a very polar dipole that points or favors chlorine, where there's excess electron density at chlorine and there's a lack of electron density at carbon. However, because of the great symmetry of this molecule, it is tetrahedral, all of these bond dipoles have a net dipole of zero, or they cancel out. Thus, the electron density in this molecule is evenly distributed throughout the electron cloud and there are no permanent partial separations in charge. And therefore, these cannot stabilize charge molecules. Or they cannot form ion dipole type interactions with various ions in solution. On the other hand, polar molecules are quite good at forming ion dipole-like or dipole-dipole interactions, and they can stabilize charge. Now stabilizing charge, of course, is going to make it less reactive. And so we'll talk about cases where that hinders the reaction or makes the reaction much slower. So solvents uh, have two broad categories, but now we're going to further think about how they are split into even more specific subcategories.
So in this class, generally polar solvents are going to be those of interest, uh, especially in SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 reactions, where we're going to have some amount of charge separation in the transition state. These all involve either a charged ion that must be solvated in solution for the reaction to start, uh, or they'll involve some charge buildup during a transition state, such as when a leaving group departs. And so generally nonpolar solvents aren't going to work well, uh, because you can't even put a charged molecule in a, in a nonpolar solvent. It just won't dissolve. Um, so there are two subtypes. of polar solvents. First those that are protic and those that are non or aprotic or commonly. Protic solvents are unique and they have the ability to hydrogen bond or they have key functional groups like OH usually sometimes NH bonds, alcohols, carboxylic acids, and amines. Whereas aprotic solvents, these have permanent bond dipoles, but they do not include a hydrogen atom. So we'll say permanent bond dipole without a proton. So I'll give you an example. A protic solvent, most common of course is water, has two very, very polar OH bonds favoring an excess of electron density at the oxygen atom and leaving electrophilic or acidic character at the protons. Conversely, an aprotic example would be something like dimethylformamide. where there are oxygens and there are nitrogens, but the hydrogens are only connected to carbons. There are no polar OH or NH bonds, and therefore the protons do not have a great deal of positive charge. Hydrogen bonding is all about electrostatics and how much positive charge is on these protons so they can interact with a negative charge. The hydrogen here is attached to an sp2 carbon that is electronegative, but this CH bond is not nearly as polar as the hydrogen oxygen bond would be. There is a net dipole, of course, in the direction of the oxygen. So we do have charge separation. Electrophilic character at the carbon and nucleophilic character at the oxygen. So generally, protic solvents are going to be very good at stabilizing anions. The hydrogens on water, for example, could sit next to a cyanide anion in solution and do what's called hydration or form a hydration sphere around it where the partial positive of water interacts with the carbon of cyanide and basically covers it up. Or this nucleophile is now solvated it doesn't really own that negative charge anymore, and therefore it's less reactive. So protic solvents are going to stabilize anions and render them less nucleophilic. And many times the nucleophiles we'll be using in E2 type and SN2 type reactions are going to be anionic like cyanide, specifically at SN2. So Aprotic solvents are going to do a great job of solvating cations via their partially negative end of the bond dipole. Say the potassium ion that came along with cyanide is introduced into a DMF solution. This would now interact with multiple oxygen atoms of various DMF solvent molecules. And so these aprotic solvents do a good job of pulling the cation and anion apart so that the anion is free and can react, but they don't really have the protons with any positive charge that are available to solvate 
the anion. So the anions go unsolvated for the most part in aprotic solvents. So I'll say that aprotic solvents solve uh, cations but leave anions unreactive. So negatively charged nucleophiles sort of maintain their electron density and remain very nucleophilic in aprotic solvents. So I want to give you some examples of common solvents we'll see and talk about this concept of dielectric and how we use it to compare the various polarities. So the dielectric constant, which we denote as epsilon, this is going to be a measure of how well a solvent is able to screen or stabilize charge. Or sort of prevents a positive and a negative charge from seeing one another. And they screen charges both positive and negative. And so an increase in the polarity is measured by a subsequent increase in dielectric constant. You can just think of it as being a larger number if the solvent is more polar. And I'll give you some specific examples of dielectric values for protic and aprotic, not because you need to know these, um, but I just want to show you some various trends. And it's not always true that one is more polar than the other. Okay. Remember the key difference between these two subtypes is that simply protic is able to hydrogen bond. So protic solvent, the one you're familiar with is water. And it is far more polar in its own category. At least 20 dielectric units more polar than any other common solvent we will see in this course. Next in line is formic acid, which does have a single OH bond, uh, but it doesn't have two very polar OH bonds like water, and it has a dielectric value of 58. Another example would be something like ethanol, which lacks this polar CO bond, so there is more positive charge on the proton of the formic acid that's reflected in its pKa being lower relative to the amount of positive charge on ethanol. So we'll show a smaller delta positive there. And then um, a protic solvent that's hardly polar is acetic acid. We add more carbon-hydrogen bonds relative to formic acid. And CH bonds are nonpolar. Carbon and uh, uh, hydrogen show, share electron density equally. So decreasing polarity decreases dielectric constant. The most polar aprotic solvent you will see is dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO. Its dielectric value is 47. And that sulfur oxygen bond is very polar, which can be explained by this zwitterionic resonance form. <coughs> the solvent I used in the previous example, dimethylformamide, has the same polarity as acetonitrile. These both have very polar either uh, CO bonds or CN bonds. So I'll indicate the bond dipoles in red. Notice that these bond dipoles do not involve a hydrogen atom. The hydrogens are only connected to the carbons. And then one more common solvent you'll see uses to clean all of your glassware. This is acetone with a polar CO bond. Okay, So it's not always true that protic is more polar in terms of dielectric value. DMSO, the aprotic one, is more polar than ethanol and acetic acid, um, but they have different characteristics in that these are hydrogen bonding. <coughs> 
because that very electron-poor proton is able to reach out, interact with an anion. 